Awards Executive Director. Now here it is again. <laughs> Thanks for joining me again on stage and enjoy the panel. Thank you, Zakis. Well, um, it's beautiful with the English, right? Executive Director sounds much nicer than Geschäftsstellenleiter. Um, <laughs> But uh, it's a great opportunity uh, for us to, to be with you here, and um, I'm also happy to see the panelists in a second. Um, I must say, uh, for us in the Hochschule Forum Digitalisierung, which you can try to translate into the Forum on Digital Transformation in Higher Education, has been out here for 10 years now. So for us, it's a great moment also to share this festival with you and to dig into the points where it's maybe a bit more difficult, given the circumstances, how is our technology world uh, impacting education, and how we can best make sense out of it, and what are the challenges. And in this sense, I'm still waiting for the panelists to see them, but um, we thought it would be a great opportunity to compare the different perspectives, because from my experience, it makes a difference where you are. So uh, if you live in, in New York, and by the way, Risa, great to have you with us today. Um, if you are from, in, from the Netherlands, Hannah, if you are coming from very different systems, then you do have a different educational background. And you may have different structures and different mindsets. And so this is something that I would like to discuss with the panelists. And I still need from the colleagues over there the info. Is the panel now on or not? Yes? Because I can't see them here. Now I can see them. Hey, I was waiting for you for the whole time. Great to have you with us. Fantastic. So first round would be introduction. Uh, who is with us? Um, then we have a short interactive session with the mentee, where I would also like you to, to join in, and the panelists will respond. And then we have a classic uh, uh, discussion with this topic on how is this uh, generative AI, in particular, uh, challenging uh, higher education overall. So um, great that the technique is working now. And I start with you, Bas, because uh, you are next door, at least in terms of um, a regional distance, so you are from the Netherlands, and Ben is the strategic advisor on digitalization for education at the CIO office of the Erasmus University Rotterdam, which by the way is a very, very interesting institution, and also working for NPULSE as a project lead on generative AI. NPULSE is a three-digit million funding scheme from the Dutch government, which is uh, working with digital transformation in education. And Bas, uh, in particular, brings a practical and comprehensive perspective to the transformation of education through digitalization and artificial intelligence, working on experimentation, which I think is very interesting here, and testing spaces, and is concerned with how staff can be qualified to work with generative AI. Welcome. Yeah. To you, Bas, and I hope the latency is not so strong, but I, I think you can hear me, right? Yeah, thank you very much, Oliver. Thank you for welcoming me. Um, uh, just to tell you, if you see me as frozen as I see myself, I usually am a little bit more lively. Uh, <laughs> but there's something with the image there. Uh, that's OK. Um, it's good to be there. Um, you already introduced me, so I'll yeah. leave the space for the other panelists. Yeah, or your Thanks question. a lot. And it's great uh, because I was wondering, do you hear me now? So uh, you are with us, and that's the most important. Then we move from the Dutch side of things up to the north, the very north. Welcome to Hanna-Marie Puska from Finland. She is the director of Digital Service Business Unit at CSC, which translates into Center for Science in Finland. And this is uh, National Enren for Finland. And she develops and operates on digital services for Finnish research and education. Her focus is on digitalization, artificial intelligence. And um, she works on improving those processes in education, research, and the public sector while ensuring data protection and regular Rotary compliance. By the way, my English is rusty. I hope it works well. Very warm welcome to you and to Finland. 
you can hear and uh, see as well, so that's, that's great. I can see a reaction here. Very good. Then we go to the Anglo-Saxon part. Uh, and I'm very happy, Sue, that you are with us um, because you are working as the head of AI and co-design at the Center for AI of JISC, which is also a national organization from the UK. Um, and you have multifaceted interests in the advancement and ethical application of artificial intelligence within the education sector. And as a leader of AI activities at JISC, you are dedicated to driving the development and adaptation of AI technologies across member institutions. Very good to have you with us. And then we are going all the way to the US. So <coughs> Philip, as an expert on digital education for a long time, we know each other from the MIT Media Lab, but nowadays you work as a vice president of technology innovation at Axim Collaborative, which works kind of like a foundation as a director of digital learning and research uh, scientist, you were in the role for MIT Media Lab. I'm really happy to have you all with us. And I would just like to take one more minute why we do this, because I was thinking now, uh, when we were doing delegation trips in the recent years, we were visiting um, all your countries, and we noticed these kind of differences. But now with this watershed moment, what is generative AI doing to the educational sector, this is maybe bringing us not in the same boat necessarily, but maybe in, in a set of challenges and perspectives that we would like uh, to dig into together. And therefore, Sue, we were thinking it would be great to use the model that your colleagues uh, with you maybe were working on. This is the maturity model. And this is where the Mentimeter comes in, and my colleague will post the link. And I would like to ask you from uh, the audience, be it online, be it here in the room, to join us on this interesting question. If you look at where is your institution with handling these uh, challenges, these processes on AI, where do you see your institution best positioned right now? Where is the current status quo? If you look at it from a approaching and understanding first a notion up to experimenting and exploring, maybe already operationalizing uh, processes embedded or even transforming, um, then it would be interesting to see your dots popping up here. Um, and we may get back to it later, but since we are on this national comparison uh, perspective, I was asking and uh, would be interested to the panelists to ask for your first round of contributions. Where do you see that within your background, member state, national mm -hmm. perspective? As subjective as it is, because to my knowledge there is no current benchmark, there is no clear standard, but um, it's interesting to hear you in a minute, and we can see from the audience uh, where are you putting your mark. So it's going to be interesting to see how we can uh, make sense out of that and how we may discuss what needs to happen in order to go more up in this maturity dynamic. So um, if I can now get back to the uh, panelists, I would like to start with you, Sue. Since JISC has been initially uh, putting up this, uh, this overview model, if you may want to uh, share with us your, uh, um, your judgment, your uh, idea, where is the UK in this process, and how would you describe the current status quo? Thanks, Ida. I'd put the UK at midpoint in the operational stage, um, and that's because there's Uh, we can't hear you now, Sue. I don't know if that's the same online. Oh, oh now you're there. Stick to, Am stick I? To I'll go. <laughs> uh, I place the UK at the midpoint of operational, and that's because it's patchy in some ways. So um, most of our institutions, we deal with all colleges and universities in the UK. 
were in the experimenting and exploring. And over the last few months, they've been moving into the operational phase. And that's because, you know, AI is becoming every day, starting to be embedded in all the tools we use. So people are having to respond. But there's still some issues, particularly around institutional adoption of some of these large language models and tools. So midpoint of the operational, planning their move across the model, but not everybody's there yet, but they'll get there. Okay, we may get back to that. Thanks for this initial statement, Sue. And then we may move over to, I will look at Finland. How is it over there in the front runner educational system of Finland? <laughs> Thank you, can you hear me? Okay. Um, uh, one of our government's policy goals is that Finland is a pioneering in technologies like AI and quantum and cyber security. And I would see if, if we see AI as uh, automatizing processes or digitalization, then, then uh, uh, many organizations are at, at maybe at the stage four, but when it comes to AI tools based on large language models, so, so I would see that we are in stage one or two, so experimenting, testing and so on. And it's also that the, the opinion in general is that the tools are not that not yet that developed that we couldn't even be further at its stage. So it also depends on how how these tools and, and models are developing. Thank you. And I like to move directly on to to the Netherlands, given uh, that NPulse has been loaded uh, with, uh, let's say, resources. How do you experience the practices right now? Yeah, so I would say that in the Netherlands, um, some of the institutions are actually on the level of uh, operational, even though if you really look within the institution and you look at the teaching um, and education itself, um, Probably it's a little bit left of operational. People are still adopting and, and seeing what they have to do and what are the possibilities. And nationwide, there are still a lot of institutions where they're looking at it and approaching understanding. Some of them are experimenting, exploring, but they don't yet have it fully operational. Uh, this is, of course, what we're going to be undertaking or what I'm going to be undertaking uh, at Ampos to make this generally available and used uh, wherever education has a need for it. So more or less that field. Thank you. And, and I would maybe just uh, start asking you uh, another question because I noticed also with uh, this uh, short introduction that you put a lot of emphasis on the training dimension and on maybe experimentation within the institution. So, Coming from Rotterdam and maybe also noticing how other institutions play that or uh, apply that, what's your perception right now? How easy or difficult is it, for instance, to work with professors? Um, well, first I have to correct you a little bit. I, I work from Rotterdam, but I am from Amsterdam. Very <laughs> important in the Netherlands to make this distinction. Um, in, in working with professors, I see that you have, like usual, you have a lot of front runners, uh, not the biggest group, but you have front runners who are busy, who were busy immediately by themselves already, who have been using the commercially available tools. They have developed best practices, they have developed first insights, but uh, it's tough for them to really move further. The second group of teachers that you have to warm up to the applications and the possibilities and who are perhaps a bit more skeptical. Um, it takes a little bit more time and for them, I see that we need to really look at supporting them. So within the institution, we have people who are actually available in helping them developing things like prompt libraries um, so that they can see what are the best practices starting to think about what is the impact on assessment um, and what do they have to do there. Um, a couple of them, of course, are also still looking into uh, um, tools to check whether something was AI generated or not. It does take some time. And then the final group, which are really skeptical and, and feel that there's uh, no need. Um, well, I guess that's the next phase to reach. 
Thank you for now, Bas. And then we um, would maybe wonder, Philip, how is it uh, over in the, in the US scenery? Um, how do you perceive uh, the current uh, overall situation if you look at it from a national perspective? Uh, yeah, and I would love to tell you, but I don't know if you can hear me. Can you yes. hear me? Yes, we can. <laughs> okay, fantastic. And it's even almost um, without latency. Okay, that's great. Um, so actually, you know, to some degree, very similar to what the other colleagues re reported, I would add maybe two dimensions from the US. Um, we have a very, we have a large number of colleges and university comparatively, and we have a high level of diversity in terms of how well they're resourced, how large they are, how many students they have, how much money they have per student. And you can map the AI adoption almost um, to the economic status of the institution more than to data maturity, for example. So the well-resourced institutions are further to the right. I would say maybe some in category four, some in category three, but the institutions that serve the majority of the students in the US, community colleges, large public universities tend to be more in stage one. Um, so there's a big difference there. And then the other thing I wanted to add is, um, and Sue kind of, mentioned this a little bit, I find it really hard to answer the question for the general topic of AI, because predictive analytics and machine learning models have been around for 70 years. Many of those are built into tools that the universities are already using. So those are kind of part of the operation. But when it comes to large language models, that's a totally different product uh, built on AI and the adoption path is very different for those. So I think it also makes sense to differentiate a little bit between the different types of AI and the different applications that, that it enables, and then look at kind of the, the maturity uh, adoption across the spectrum. Right, thank you, Philip. And, and I would actually like to, to underline uh, that differentiation in the sense that I, I believe from everybody here in the room, um, we, we share the same or similar moment that uh, somewhere in, uh, one and a half years ago, suddenly people were looking at AI differently. Suddenly there was a new tool that was kind of challenging uh, the world and that is still in a very strong dynamic. Uh, this, this sort of technology tool uh, direction is still uh, ongoing, uh, challenging institutions to find their strategies, to find the right way of handling um, this sort of uh, development. So in this regard, I would la maybe like to get back to you because you mentioned um, from the perspective of your foundation or entity, um, Exim Collaborative, that you are also developing, uh, let's say, new solutions uh, that may help uh, institutions in different uh, ways to, to develop tools. Maybe you can uh, share a bit this uh, experience that you are, how you are working with the higher education system overseas. Sure, yeah, and maybe just one word about Axum. We are a nonprofit organization and foundation that was spun out of MIT and Harvard with the proceeds from the sale of edX. So we operate like a Stiftung in Germany. We give grants, we support projects. We don't really build technology ourselves with one small exception. Um, and uh, we were also set up not to, and my board members will probably not be so happy, but we were not set up to support MIT and Harvard students primarily. We were set up to support students in the institutions that serve the majority of students in the US. I mentioned community colleges before, large public universities, minority serving institutions. And so in the way, when we approach the topic of AI, we are working with institutions that do not have a lot of resources. They do not have a lot of financial resources. They also don't have a lot of capacity. There's some, sometimes there's one person who is responsible for all of their data management for the entire institution. And so um, designing for that uh, situation requires a very different approach than designing for MIT and Harvard um, uh, constraints. And so what we try to do is make sure that the students and the faculty members of those institutions are involved in the design of the applications and they can raise their they can present their use cases they can be very clear on what their students need and what their faculty members need um, and then we pair them up with technology companies or nonprofits 
to make sure that the solutions actually serve the needs of those institutions. And you know that means cost is one factor, of course, but it's actually much more fitting into the workflows and fitting into the way that people are operating today so that this new technology doesn't feel like something that they have to change everything about the way that they're working because change is hard. It's always hard, um, especially in higher education. Uh, so, so we try to, we talk about inclusive innovation. It's basically a co-design process that we try to support by bringing together these different groups, making sure that the needs of those students and institutions that are not maybe the priority for the big technology companies, um, that those are at the center of the, the, the initiative. Thank you. And we touched that uh, on our preparationary talk, um, the question of collaboration here between different uh, stakeholders or between different uh, institutions as well. So maybe if you would like uh, to share some of your experiences in, in uh, your respective countries, how do you see the need here? How do you see the development in terms of collaborating on uh, these questions together? Sue, I see you nodding. Would you like to start? Happy to. Um, I think that's probably one of the, uh, the spaces where we add most value because we bring together a lot of collaborative groups and we're having a, an awful lot of collaboration across colleges and universities in the UK. And we've got several working groups where we've got uh, very active participants from across the sector helping to develop resources that are shared across and I think this is seen as a uh, collaborative problem. So we have monthly um, sessions with, um, they're open to all of our members, you know, they drop in or they don't. But we look to solve questions collaboratively. So people are sharing guidance, they're sharing difficulties they're having around procurement. So particularly around, sorry, I'm focusing very much around the generative AI space rather than the machine learning and the more developed AI space. But in, in the new and developing generative AI space, they're very open, very collaborative, very um, communally problem solving and looking at how they can embed these tools, what kind of practices they can bring in and how to make changes and adapt. So I'm very, very positive about collaboration. And I think it's, it's what's helping um, the UK to embrace these tools and adapt practice. It sounds uh, very interesting because it seems like a, a process where you can also share the different uh, experiences. And in this regard, how do you see the role of JISC? Uh, how do you best uh, support that? Do you facilitate the whole process or what's your role in it? Yeah, so we, um, we facilitate the collaborate, collaboration. But then we also respond to the gaps. So we work with our groups around particular areas. So maybe we've got a group at the moment looking at assessment and maintaining academic integrity um, with generative AI. And we'll work with the, the groups to identify what the top priorities are and then look to see where we might be able to de develop some guidance or some uh, resources that can help them. So we've done things like develop um, resources on how to adapt your assessments. Now we live in a generative AI world. So both facilitating the collaboration, but then also responding and trying to support institutions to move across that maturity model by filling in their gaps and responding to their needs. Thank you. And uh, maybe it's interesting if you relate that uh, even within the institution, how do you actually uh, do it there? How do you uh, have practices uh, that you may want to share? Uh, if you have uh, that, please uh, feel invited also on uh, the online channels to, to share that. Um, I was thinking, Bas, one thing that stuck uh, to my head um, was a statement from your side where you said, well, we don't need to talk so much, we need to uh, experiment, we need to do it more than just the talking. So if you put that into correspondence with collaborating, how do you uh, perceive it in, in your uh, area or also uh, within uh, the Dutch uh, higher education? Yeah, so, so I, I mentioned it just uh, for, for the audience um, that within my institution we were discussing about the impact, about the implications um, 
and at some point um, I, I brought them together and, and suggested that we actually start to build something and to make sure that we could start experimenting. Um, right now I'm doing I'm starting this as well on a national level, which is really good to see because all the things Sue has been describing on collaboration here is, is what I see happening as well on an impulse level. So I get all different kinds of institutions together. We can talk about what are the use cases um, for education? How would they want to use it? And, and the good thing is because you can actually start to use it, we are learning together and we can start to build best practices. We can start to, to see what we can share. We can also start um, several other groups, for instance, are already diving into what is the impact of assessment or on assessment and what could we be changing there? And as far as I'm concerned, because we are starting, we are actually doing something and we're having a short feedback so we can learn, uh, adapt and then um, continue to develop the, 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 the platform that we're going to offer actually. This also helps the institutions and helps education to think about it um, and really to help each other. So for me, this is very supportive of the collaboration. Thank you. And I don't know, is there anyone uh, on here who would like to share their experience or perception? How do you see that? I mean, just keep it in mind that we also have a microphone available here uh, for this session. It's possible that you can just, um, if you feel like you can stand up and, and join the discussion, because I do think there is a lot of expertise in the room and we may come into this mode of, of sharing experiences as well. Um, I was uh, discussing with you also one question in terms of how do you position, uh, given that uh, right now uh, big tech is uh, playing a very uh, important role in this picture, who is providing which kind of uh, services, who is licensing um, possibilities and how can this uh, be shared among uh, staff and students. Um, how do you picture in this sense the collaboration here um, and how do you may, uh, to put it a bit provocatively, put the value of autonomy or sovereignty um, in regards to state-of-the-art technology? Where, where do you see is, is the ball rolling here and what is your position? <coughs> Yeah, so from uh, within my institution, I see several developments. Um, we started um, because one of these reasons, because the models are, uh, that are commercially available are not transparent and you don't know uh, on what information it's been based and trained. We started to build our own model um, and, and, and it's created, it's ready, it's called the Erasmus language model. But that is not something that the wider audience within the institution is, is uh, wanting to use or that is actually going to be very useful for the generic purpose and the purpose of teaching. Uh, what does it mean to use a large language model in education and what do you need uh, as a student to learn? So from my perspective in the past time, the collaboration that we had together with some of the big parties is actually really good. Um, within our context of the Netherlands, there are is a very broad and well set and well defined uh, um, agreement on on our privacy and data protection. So that within this framework of uh, um, agreements, basically with the parties, we could really start to experiment. Uh, yet immediately up front, we said that we want to make sure that we're not going to be dependent on a single uh, provider or a, a single commercial uh, provider of a large language model, but that we wanted to build something up where we would probably start with a single one to make it achievable, but later extend to other models, including open source models, including our own models, including specific models for specific use cases, and, and this is the way where we see we can have a collaboration which we feel is necessary to be able to keep on the pace because the developments are going very fast and also um, find our way within the possibilities of some kind of independence and still have the ability to choose models also to make um, our students and our teachers aware of these choices. Thank you. 
Any of you would like to add to that? Philip. Yeah, I'd love to chime in on this um, and agree with everything Bas said, uh, as usual, um, but uh, maybe adding a couple of uh, notes to it. One is, um, I think there's a real challenge around where the leading edge research is being done in AI. Traditionally, the universities do the the most groundbreaking, the most fundamental research, and then it kind of trickles down into industry and gets commercialized. But in these frontier models, we're seeing that that has changed a little bit where some of the most leading edge research is actually done in industry. And I think that is a big risk. And so I would, um, I would hope that we can reinvest in AI research in the higher education sector where research is done transparently, openly, peer reviewed, share it with the world and so that everyone can benefit. So we don't give up kind of the research field just to the corporate um, providers. Um, and then in the US, I would say there's now kind of growing awareness that for the most advanced models, it probably doesn't make sense to try to compete with industry. Um, but a better approach and cost is coming down so rapidly that cost is probably not going to be an issue. But the, the challenge is more around negotiating better conditions for access so that the data is protected, the student data doesn't get used for training, um, and setting up kind of environments in which students and faculty can use these foundation models safely. And that's where I think collaboration plays a big role, because if one institution goes to OpenAI, OpenAI is not necessarily going to change their model, um, their, their business model, not their our AI model. But if you know the California Community College system, which has 100 and I think 13 institutions, two million students, it's one of the largest higher education systems in the world. When they show up and talk to OpenAI, they have leverage that one institution by itself wouldn't have. And so I think collaboration among the institutions, so that they can then together negotiate different conditions for access to these models, is a real opportunity. That's a very interesting question, and I'm sure Sue or also Hannah Marie, from an Enron uh, perspective, how do you actually broker that uh, that kind of relation, or how is your uh, take on that? I see Sue hands first. Yeah, I mean, um, we're quite lucky at DISC in that we do have our um, licensing team, and um, we see that very much as our role to work with the big players like Microsoft, like uh, OpenAI and Google, to negotiate on behalf of the sector. As Philip said, it's about um, leveraging that collaborative purchasing power and using that to improve conditions as well as try and drive down power, but particularly around, you know, that security for the institutions around data. How is it in, in Finland? Uh, yeah, I think it's a bit similar. We have a very we are a small country with small universities, so our negotiation power is is uh, not that big as in the other countries. But um, so we also, as CSE, we support the support the higher education institutions in in negotiation uh, licenses and so. But I would take this uh, uh, digital sovereignty to a more general level. So I think it's uh, also a European level. Uh, discussion that the decision makers should uh, should think about. Uh, we are involved in one, in one EU-funded project, Open Web Search, where the goal is to build an open web index in in Europe to to sort of um, reduce the dependence on the global pay players, Google, Google, and others. So this is one one initiative that. Uh, there should be more more at the European level, and Europe should invest more in building building a European infrastructure there. And this is also related to 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 what data AI is based on. I see some nodding, uh, at least to some extent. I I, I do feel um, that maybe the question how is it first of all uh, visible is maybe also one reason why we are talking uh, that uh, it seems sometimes you don't even know within the institution or within one country you have a clear overview less uh, in Europe or internationally however it may 
be very interesting to understand better how uh, certain practices uh, are taking place and how learnings can also be uh, shared. So I invite also all of us to maybe uh, see how we can better make use of that. I have two, let's say, directions um, of questions that I would still like to, to share with you. Um, one is directly related to the question, uh, in Europe we often have a very public funded domain in, in education. I mean, in, in the UK it's uh, maybe a bit a different picture, but overall we have um, uh, a lot of uh, public um, uh, schemes, um, like in, in the Dutch, uh, now with NPALS as well. Um, how do you see the role of the government here? Uh, how do you, in this sense, when you speak about Europe and maybe potential uh, infrastructures or architectures, um, what can be done on a national level to support uh, what you consider most pressing or needed in, in the institutions? Well, I would, I would be tempted to say actually that the very fact that uh, something like Ampels has been created is one of the ways in which the government is helping and supporting us to collaborate and, and, and find an approach to do this together. And of course, NPULSE is not only about uh, um, AI or generative AI, uh, to, just to be clear, it's, it's a wider initiative which is supposed to be uh, impactful on the entire of education. Um, but still, this is one of the ways. So we have, of course, some of the guidelines and the, the legislation coming from the EU. And then within Impulse, a lot of attention and space um, and direction to bring us together and collaborate and have a collaborative approach. Thank you. I, I can see now on my screen, and I must admit, it's very weird to look at you knowing that you are in the camera there, then you have the audience just watching like this, but you know, I'm halfway okay, so I hope you are all too. So one question that was asked before my screen got black, was how can international collaboration between universities benefit from the different approaches and how can we come up with an educated and meaningful way to use AI? Is there any... Well, yeah, um, so, so just, just responding um, um, uh, from, from uh, like uh, how it comes to mind. Firstly, I think there would be a great possibility for international uh, uh, collaboration. I, I hear also on this panel uh, things that we didn't hear yet in the preparation, where I believe that if we would be able to find a way to share and learn from each other, we, we would be able, as an educational sector uh, internationally, um, over all the countries, be able to better uh, go along with this this new approach, this, these new technologies or possibilities uh, that are available. Um, but organizing it is, is quite difficult. And by now I forgot your second question, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> what is the, the, how can we come up with an educated and meaningful way to use AI? Was, yeah, so my answer would always be, I'm sorry if I'm going first, I will try to be quiet after this, but my answer would be exactly how we approach it is, is make sure that it's available, make sure that we have guidance available and then um, assist education in starting to work with this. You start always with the people who want to go first, you try to help the others, you also have to help the critical ones and from that we we, we uh, make mistakes, we learn, we adapt, we see what is necessary, and we go steps forward. Thank you. Is there anyone else who wants to contribute to the question? Sue. Um, yeah, I think, I mean, it's, it's always going to be hard, um, probably impossible to have a single kind of approach. But I think, you know, A, by having conversations like this, but um, I agree with what Baz said, you know, we can share, we can start to share what we're all doing, we can share what activity is happening. But one of the things I personally would like us to do more is that we're very good at sharing success and we're less good at sharing what we deem to be failure, thus, you know, dooming everybody else to repeat that failure. 
more than likely. So, you know, I, I'd like us to, to kind of have a way of sharing failure where it's not seen negatively, but seen as a way of saving other people some pain um, and preventing them from doing the same mistakes. But, you know, we're all doing a lot of active, a lot of activity in this space. And surely there's a way of sharing that. Well, we certainly will move along with that. And I, can, I saw Hannah Mari before as well. And Philip, uh, you also wanted to contribute. Yeah, I think the uh, challenges are, are very similar within countries and uh, between countries. So this is definitely where, where we can do collaboration, learn, learn from each other. But then what the, at national level, the government should do so that, for example, Finland, we have this freedom of education and research, so the teachers and researchers can use the tools that they want. And uh, there's not, not much to influence that, but where, where the investment should go is the development of competencies and skills. And, and in Finland, uh, the ministry uh, uh, discussed the digital building. So this is an uh, understanding of, of how, how this how AI works, how these algorithms work, understanding what comes out from, from, from AI. And so, so this is something that, that should be yeah, kept in mind in, in all collaboration and all, all countries. And this sort of uh, literacy question behind is maybe also uh, interesting to, to put in relation to, to the people we are working with, like students, uh, for instance. Um, and I remember, Philip, you mentioned that there are maybe the first studies that uh, um, could be interesting also to see who is learning more quickly uh, new technology or competencies. Um, how, how do you see that uh, from your uh, perception overseas? Um, great. I'm going to be a politician here and use your question to answer the question I want to answer, which is <laughs> just adding one thing to the last question, which is, um, I, I think um, uh, sharing uh, both successes and failures is important. I think one thing is also important that um, we should track the outcomes, even for these experiments. Um, and this is where it connects to your second question, which is um, like making sure that the benefits really apply to all kinds of students and not just the most advanced in the most advanced institutions, because it's it's relatively easy to show successes in that environment. It's really hard to then replicate that in very different contexts. So I think we, we should at least, I, I'm not saying we have to have an evaluation framework all worked out, but we should at least track some data on what's the effect on students, retention, graduation, grades, et cetera, et cetera. Um, uh, because that, that will then enable us to know what worked and what didn't. And I, I see a lot of experiments right now being more driven by just excitement. And so then it's, it'll be hard to know what was the actual effect of, of the experiment. Um, and then just to your, to your point about who does this um, benefit? Well, there's one interesting dynamic, and I think it's too early to know really, but some of the earlier studies on um, labor productivity show that these new generative AI tools, large language models, seem to be most useful for workers at the lower end, so low skilled workers, um, and help kind of it helps them become much more productive. Whereas for people at the at the higher end, it seems to be less to make less of a difference. It helps everyone, but the difference, the, the differential seems highest for the people who are low skilled, which if that really is true, I, as I said, it's too early. I think that would be terrific um, because so often the technology benefits those who already are far ahead even more. And so then they just move further ahead. And if the case was really that this was kind of a democratizing technology in a way, I think that would be great. So I'd love to see many more studies on like what's the impact on student learning and then looking at kind of different groups of students and seeing how that how their effects are different. Yeah, very interesting. And I can maybe share from a German perspective with uh, the work we did, we do in the forum and some of the change makers are maybe here even in the room. Um, we uh, feel the, the first question is maybe, do they sit on the table? Uh, is there some uh, kind of uh, shared uh, discussion? Uh, we just have a survey going on uh, um, among German institutions where we also ask about that. I'm happy to share the results in a couple of weeks, but 
Um, it is maybe also within the institution an open question, where is it actually taking place and how are students addressed, involved, how much clarity uh, is there starting with the, with the use or access in the first place. Um, I noticed there is another question um, which relates to the Finnish uh, colleague, uh, Hanna Mari. Um, uh, the question is, is uh, Ava Alto architecture concept be applicable on a new anthropology? And I must admit, I'm not fully aware of uh, this, so maybe you can contextualize also a little bit. <laughs> and it looks like you're maybe also not. Yeah, maybe not the right person to answer that <laughs> interesting question. If the person is in the room, this would be the moment to stand up and maybe give a bit more texture to this question. Um, but if not, then maybe um, is there any other question in, in the audience that you have that you consider interesting to ask also to our international colleagues? You know, while you're waiting for hands, could I talk a little bit more about the students? Yes, please do so. Um, because we've just recently finished some student discussion forum, so we've uh, spoken to students across the colleges, uh, across universities, right through to um, doctoral level, um, looking at their expectations from AI, um, particularly generative AI. And, um, you know, we did this last year, and we've done this again this year, and we've seen their use become more sophisticated. They've moved away from seeing generative AI as an answer provider. They're starting to use it as a digital coach. But also their expectations from their education have changed and matured, and they are expecting their education to embrace the fact that we live in a generative AI world. They're expecting um, their institutions to help them balance intellectual development with using AI tools, and they're expecting support around things like information and digital literacy, and making sure they have the skills they need to go into the jobs where effectively, you know, generative AI is out there, it's being used in the workplace. Students at the moment are feeling, I would say, probably disappointed that they feel they're not getting the skills they need. And particularly, you know, in our case, there was a huge amount of concern from students around things like, you know, bias, equity, accessibility. But on a positive note, and I'm picking up on Philip's point earlier, there was a huge amount of um, feedback around how generative AI students are particularly helping students with accessibility and other needs and to the point where it's helping them stay in education. So I just thought it was worth sharing that. Yeah, it might be interesting to also bring together uh, students from different uh, backgrounds on these kind of questions. What do they experience? How um, do they see Thing. So I'm happy to put that uh, on a side note uh, as a follow-up potentially. I would like um, to use the remaining minutes to ask you uh, two more things. One is on a very practical uh, level, because uh, it uh, is also to some extent our common experience that um, someone has maybe a specific uh, interest in a, in a tool or in a practice. So if you think back in, in the last uh, couple of months, what you have perceived, what you have seen, is there a kind of highlight that you would like to point at that you uh, feel is worth uh, recommending? Um, and I see all of you nodding, or two at least I saw it in the first place. So Bas, would you like to start that round? Yeah, sure. Um, so one of the things that I found uh, very remarkable is that while this is new technology, um, new possibilities, uh, you would expect that the challenges lie there. Um, uh, quite contrary, the challenges were more, more or less organizational. Um, so in creating something and, and putting something together and making it available for education, the difficult part was the organization and, and how to deal with it, um, how to bring it uh, along, um, what to do with the costs, uh, etc. Not even the privacy aspects, the security aspects, those were pretty quickly dealt with in, in, a, in, a, in a good fashion. Um, but this was more or less uh, an important factor. And I was surprised by this. Nice. Sue, I also saw you.
Yeah, so I'm going to go on a very personal level um, because that's that's how you ask the question. So, um, and I'm going to go with two things. So, Copilot 365, the meeting summarization, I'm finding that so useful. I hate taking notes. I'm really bad at it. And I'm really bad at reading my own writing and the notes afterwards. So the fact that this will just give me a nice automated summary with action points um, allocated to the specific people, I find really, really helpful. And I absolutely love it. And the other tool is something that we've been trialing recently. We do a lot of training for our members, uh, practical training. And we've been trialing a tool called Synthesia, um, which is um, allows you to use avatars and um, generated voices to generate the uh, webinar training from your written materials. And that is so useful. It's a tool that's really quick and easy to use. And it's just saving those immense amount of times where when you're trying to record something, you're just re-recording. So a 40 minute session may take four and a half hours to record something that you're happy with. Using Synthesia, you can do um, a quick video in around 10 minutes. So it's a personal favorite. Thanks for sharing, Sue. <laughs> Philip. I'm, I'm also happy to chat, chat, um, chat, uh, chip in here. Um, so I feel like there's a lot of talk about AI tutors uh, in this initial phase. You're going to have this tutor. You're going to learn from this tutor. Um, and there's much less talk about an AI advisor, which would be the person at the university who's not helping you with your subject matter questions or your coursework, but who's helping with all of the administrative stuff. How do I get my financial aid? Um, what courses do I still need to graduate? Um, I'm looking for new housing. What does the university offer in terms of support of housing? Mental health and well-being is a huge topic, at least in the US. Um, so there, there are all these other things that students may struggle as they're trying to navigate uh, college or university. And often those are the reasons why students actually end up leaving. It's not necessarily the academic uh, challenges. And that's a field where these large language models are actually very, very good because um, they are able to communicate with the students in a way that is that is remarkably natural. And so students can ask a wide range of questions and then the, those tools can kind of engage with that and try to help them navigate the information that's available. So I think that's a field. There are two companies in the US that we are kind of interested in. One is Mainstay. They're very well uh, established already. They work with many, many universities and they, they have a great track record using text-based messaging and they're moving into this space. And then another one is called Campus Evolve, which is the exact opposite end of the spectrum. It's just three people. They left Microsoft and Blackboard and they're building this kind of in their garage, um, but they're doing really innovative uh, stuff on the technology side to kind of see how good can you get these um, systems with very little data actually by just scraping websites from the institutions. Um, so those are, I think that whole field of student advising, I think is really ripe for innovation. Sounds interesting to get back to. And uh, Hannah Mari, do you have also uh, something to share with us? Uh, yeah, my example is also from stu student administration, but a bit different uh, perspective. So uh, one thing that we have actually a few small projects going on in Finland is, is uh, tagging and classifying learning offering based on their descriptions to uh, individual skills so that the people can match their interests or skills or uh, previous education to uh, learning offerings from, from different uh, education institutions. So this is something that where AI can be used uh, combined with uh, semantic ontologies and so on. This is, I think this, this is something that would be uh, or is uh, something that uh, institutions in other countries are doing and maybe a subject to a further collaboration between between countries. Thank you. And, and I like to use this last word of further collaboration. Um, given the time, uh, we are already at the end of this session. I feel what we try to achieve to maybe get a bit more light into the different practices, uh, developments, initiatives, fields to me like we have just started. However, given this sort of context, I feel this is maybe also very normal. Uh, and so 
Um, I would be happy if we can get back to that at another uh, stage. I uh, certainly feel we can learn a lot from uh, your practices uh, in different countries and also from the way how you perceive um, what's actually going on. Um, my final question to you was, and maybe we will keep that for 2025, uh, would be what has changed in one year? What is different if we would sit here uh, in a time machine 12 months ahead? Uh, what do you think would have changed uh, or what you wish would have changed? In one sentence, if you like, um, what do you think is different? Sue. So, and now it seems you are cut off <laughs> or the mic is just muted. Sorry, I muted. Um, I think generative AI is going to become much more invisible and we're just going to be using it as part of our daily life. Um, what we do may not change, but how we do our job, I think, will change dramatically as all these tools start to embed generative AI capabilities within them, it'll just become a standard part of our lives. Thank you. Um, if, if I was going to mention two things, um, uh, first of all, I hope uh, that we will see uh, increased literacy among teachers and students, um, uh, including awareness of when to use, when not to use, being aware of the sustainability factors, etc. Um, and what I would hope for is that we would um, re-examine how we do evaluation um, assessments because uh, it would be great if some change happens there. We will find out. Thank you, Baz. Philip? Anna Marie, do you want to go first? Uh, I can go. Um, so um, two, two, one, two quick ones. One is I would hope that we will see many more education focused open source models. They don't have to be as large as the large language models but you don't need the largest models for all of these use cases and universities are in a great position to like BAS to generate open source tools that then can be shared among other universities and we can build some of these tools ourselves. And then secondly, I would be even more ambitious than BAS and I would say, I would hope that not just the assessment, but the curriculum changes because there is a real opportunity to kind of revisit some of these ideas around experiential learning, project-based or problem-based learning, team-based learning, and those are all things that are really hard to do for an AI. And we should focus on uh, making the education experience uh, uh, focus on the things that robots can't do because the robots are always going to be better than the, than the humans or, or soon they will be. Um, so let's focus on the things that robots are really bad at, which is you know teamwork and collaboration and creativity and kind of all the things that humans are actually uniquely good at and, and the make the university look more like that. Thank you, Philip. Hannah Mari, would you like to conclude? <laughs> okay, I'm uh, interested to see how uh, fast these uh, translation, uh, translation tools uh, develop. So maybe after one year, we are able to talk in whatever language we want, and then the audience can uh, choose uh, in which language they want to hear us individually. So that's interesting. How it, what's going to happen with that? We're going to find out, and maybe with some of the things you mentioned, it seems like also an agenda that makes uh, a lot of sense to work uh, forward to. And overall, with the whole festival, the idea how we can shape the future maybe within institutions and between is a current task, and it will remain one. So I'm very, very grateful for your contribution. I'm sorry for the technical hiccups. I hope uh, it was worthwhile for you and for everybody here. So thanks for now and uh, looking forward to, to talk to you soon again. Thank you.